And so we'll be looking at the, the various uh, aspects of the drug trade and meth, heroin, and diverted pharmaceuticals, and then looking at the kind of chemical evidence that you might receive um, in the crime lab. Uh, there's a bit of review, though, because uh, a lot of these substances are chiral. So let's just go through the different kinds of, of isomers that we have. So this hopefully is familiar to you. You have, you know, different substances that you can put the same number and types of atoms together in different ways. So the constitutional isomers, this is a simple example, like dimethyl uh, ether versus ethanol have the same chemical formula. And so those would be constitutional isomers, structural isomers, putting the oxygen in different places, but same number and types of atoms. Then you get into stereoisomers. Uh, some of these can be um, mirror images of each other. So here I have D and L uh, alanine, and you can see these are mirror images and they're non-superimposable. So that's what makes them chiral. So over here on the right side, we have chiral molecules. And you can look at it, the way I've got this set up is so that you could do the, the um, a determination of their chirality. You put the, the um, um, number four, if you, if you rank these in terms of priority, and we'll look at that in the next slide, you put that fourth group in the back, which typically is hydrogen in these cases for the amino acids. And then you look at their masses of attached atoms. And so nitrogen is a larger atom than two carbons. And then you go to the next groups, what's, a, what's attached to them. So this one is, is one in priority. This one versus that one, this one has oxygens attached to it. So that's two in terms of priority. And then this is three in terms of priority. And so you see that that makes a counterclockwise turn. Here you have the opposite. One, two, three. So that makes a clockwise turn. Now it's turning over to the right. And so we use an R for that. And this is turning over to the left, which is an L. Now that is not directly mappable to D and L. D and L are reactivities. Um, and so there's the R and, oh, I'm sorry, S, I said L, this is S, R and S. The R and S don't map directly to D and L. So if you're wondering about when, you know, when it's a D, when it's an L, you actually have to, have to dig to get that information. Um, but for R and S, you can use this priority to determine. And R stands for rectus and S stands for sinister, which are Latin for right and left. Now you can have multiple chiral centers in there, and then we end up with just this general category of diastereomers, where you have two or more chirality centers. And ephedrine has two or more chiral centers, or two chiral centers. Now, in terms of this designation between R and S and D and L, the Wikipedia page is pretty good. I was looking at different sources of information for that last night, and I thought, yeah, you could just look up R, S, D, L, Cairo in Wikipedia, and you'll get to this absolute configuration, and it's a great, great article. So this um, priority that I was talking about is this con ingo prelog convention for priority, and this is allow, allows us to get unambiguous structural designations. And so here it is applied to um, that R methamphetamine and S methamphetamine. And so we're not going to really emphasize this. I just want to mainly point this out to when you get into these molecules, sometimes you have multiple centers. And so here's ephedrine. You have an RS form, an SS form, an RR form, and an SR form. And so that kind of pro provides some difficulty in terms of your analysis in, in, uh, um, in the crime lab, right? So do you need to determine all these four pieces or can you lump them together? It just depends. And so you need to look at the analysis method and, and determine if you have to get into actual s sort of stereo isolation and figuring out which enantiomers or diastereomers you have or not. Can you lump this concentration in? Would these be separable in a column or not? You know, would you, would you have uh, doublets in your peaks because they're coming out at slightly different times, um, even though it has chemically the same uh, same general structure, it's got a different chirality. And so then we get into the evidence that comes from clandestine labs or clandestine drug trade. And here's an example of the um, Birch synthesis. 
essentially you're, you're grinding up uh, Sudafed tablets, extracting with methanol. So you're going to have solvents. There's You can extract with, with ether. You can extract with a whole bunch of different solvents. Uh, this particular one is using methanol. Redissolve it in water and add uh, dry lithium from batteries to reduce the molecule. Add anhydrous ammonia to emanate the molecule. And then add an organic solvent where then you get liquid-liquid extraction. And then the uh, organic molecule goes into the organic layer and you salt it out with an HCL generator. So can you find the different five P's of evidence? So let's review, what are the five P's? Powders, plants, <laughs> plant matter. And what was, you said paraphernalia. And then you said pills over here. Yeah. And so here we have it. We've got uh, grind up the tablets. We have pills here. We have powder. Uh, the ethanol and those kinds of things, since they go into the synthesis, I might call them precursors, right? You might argue with me on that. It might be paraphernalia because it's not actually going into the drug, but it's a, again, it's a sort of a chemical substance that's participating in the reactions. Uh, but then the flasks and everything are going to be the paraphernalia. Let's see. We're going to have some powder here at the end, too. And then sometimes they'll put those into pills. So they'll make pills that will contain this meth and they'll put it into uh, other forms. Now there's a, a video. I'm not sure if we have time to watch something, but we can watch it in terms of, um, I can speed it up maybe. I do want to show you that some of the dangers in this process. So let's go ahead and do the video. Now it's a uh, no sound on the video, so I'll just have to narrate some of the stuff that's going on. We'll go one and a half. Okay. So this is called the shake and bake method or one pot methamphetamine method. So they're using a coffee grinder to grind up the ephedrine tablets. Doing this in a two liter bottle, not the most strong container, right? Putting in ammonium nitrate. Mixing the two powders. Now, where are you going to get ether if you can't go to the local chem lab? So they've got spray bottles of starter fluid. So on carbureted engines, you got a cold engine. The gasoline's not volatile enough to give you a good vapor to get that piston started. And so you can spray some ether into the air intake. Take the air filter off, give it a, just a spritz of ether. And, and it can help you start the engine. Uh, we used to have to do that on one of our diesel tractors. <laughs> and so you can turn on the glow plugs, but still diesel is not very volatile. And so you spray a little bit of starter fluid in there and it gets going. So this is the lithium out of a lithium ion uh, battery. Tear that up. Now, <laughs> lithium reacts with water. So this is, already, this is pretty dangerous all of a sudden. You get that lithium in with water, it can generate hydrogen gas spontaneously and it can spark, which sets the hydrogen gas on fire. So, then Drano, the sodium hydroxide. So you got ammonium nitrate, which is fairly dangerous. Lithium, sodium hydroxide added to ether. That's a lot of flammable solvent right there. If that container busts, 
and you have a spark or source of ignition anywhere, you've got a huge fire, terrible burns. It says add two capsules of water, which is going to react with the lithium. It's going to generate gas. So you have to vent it. And the reaction starts. Now, here's the dangerous part I want to show you. Look at down here at the bottom. Okay, let me shake it up. Really vigorous reaction. Okay, look at that. You see the lithium reacting with the water? So the water is a heavy, it's ether and water, so the phase separated. Water's down at the bottom, it's more dense. So that lithium gets down there, reacts with water, and is sparking underneath the ether, which is a flammable solvent. Not something I want to do in my basement. <laughs> <laughs> So when I talk about these places blowing up and so on, I mean, even the synthesis itself is really, really dangerous. And you're doing it in a, in a just the thinnest little plastic bottle. Really, really dangerous. That's why he has this blast shield in front of him, because if it bursts and shoots flames out, he wants to burn up his hood, not his lab coat with him in it. Okay, so then they, they get to the end. They... Um, pull some out. Now this is the salting out part. Okay, so the, the methamphetamine is dissolved in the ether layer. Okay, and then he has uh, this tube hooked up to some hydrochloric acid. It basically the vapor off a of concentrated hydrochloric acid. And that vapor goes through a little pipette and bubbles in here and it makes the, the, the base, the protonated base chloride salt. And that salt is an ionic compound, not soluble in organic. So it makes crystals. Okay, if you do that slowly, you get large crystals, and that would be called a crystal meth. If you make it fast, you get a precipitate. Still, those the microcrystals, but we wouldn't call it crystal meth. It's a powder. So the small crystals are powder. The big crystals would be crystal meth. So it, how you precipitate it would be the difference between the two. So then they take it. They do a couple of spot tests, which is kind of interesting. We could go to that NIJ report to see which ones they probably used. You get a tan color and you get a blue color. And then they do a chromatograph on it. So, play. Come on. And so, yeah, so here you go, meth. So that's, uh, that's the one pot synthesis, which is a, a favorite synthesis right now. Now, what you know, you saw all kinds of evidence. You saw batteries, torn up batteries, um, suggestive of something going on. Um, you've got uh, those ether cans that have obviously been breached to release the liquid ether, not used as a vapor spray, but used as a liquid. And then this HCL generator is a is a real um, giveaway too. So here's some pictures of the different ones. Uh, this is for salting bases out of an organic solvent. So you have an organic base dissolved in organic solvent. And if you, if you bubble HCl inside that organic solution, then it'll react instantly with that base and cause it to salt out and you can grow crystals. Um, basically, you run this reaction backwards. You flood the solution with sodium chloride, add just a bit of acid. And because there's so many chloride ions, you produce a lot of HCl gas. Um, you know, you can buy anhydrous hydrochloric acid in a, in a gaseous cylinder, but that's, why do that when you could just get a bunch of salt and put it in water and add a drop of vinegar or a drop of some sort of acid, and then you get a lot of HCl. So I flood that solution with chloride ions and a bit of acid and this reaction will move to the left. Okay, and then that, that HCl gas will bubble into the organic solution containing the free base, and then it'll, it will salt it out. Okay. Now, the number of meth labs uh, from 2000 to 2019 you see they, they, they peaked a couple of times here in the near past, the 2004 and 2010, but it looks like the problem is decreasing. 
right? Then 2019, we only had this, uh, you know, reported incidents of 100 of 890 um, clandestine meth labs in the United States, which is really good that this is this is going down. So it kind of gives you that false sense that maybe homemade meth is is not a not as much of a problem, and that may be true. But is meth still a problem? Yeah, because what they're doing is conversion labs. They're not making it from scratch. They're bringing in uh, meth in solution. So it's being made out of the country and shipped in in like juice bottles and things like that, um, or even in gas tanks. Like you could actually have it in the automobile gas tank. So in that gasoline is a huge amount of meth. You drive it across the border and then you siphon that gas out bubble HCL in it and the meth precipitates out. So they're using the gasoline in the tank as the solvent and driving it. Yeah. Now, I don't know. I mean, I, that's, I, I read that in this report. Um, I'm curious though at how the engine drives, like how, I mean, if you've got dissolved methamphetamine in the gasoline, you know, maybe they have two chambers, maybe they've gotten in there and, and had like pure gas for the car or what. But uh, that seems pretty strange. I don't know how the car would operate. And so uh, Customs and Border Protection have uh, seized, this is in the 2019. So as the clandestine meth labs have dropped, uh, cross-border seizures have gone up. And this is in kilograms here. So 68,000 kilograms seized. So yeah, the cross-border seizures have gone up even as the domestic meth labs have gone down. But the newest and most serious threat, I think, is fentanyl. You've heard of the opioid e epidemic. And so here's the total number of deaths from overdoses of cocaine. And they've been going up, okay, 2015, 16, 17, 18, um, you know, 14,000 deaths from cocaine. Here's the deaths from heroin. Okay, heroin total, again, around 14 to 15,000 deaths. Now, heroin only, um, let's see, yeah, heroin overdoses without fentanyl is the green line, and you see it's starting to drop, and the ones with fentanyl is, has, is growing. So fentanyl's being put into the heroin and causing overdoses, um, and then this is the real curve that, that shocks people, and that is these are synthetic opioids other than methadone, so fentanyl's one of these, and so you see it was around under 5,000 up to 2013, and then it's just been like a rocket going up. Now we're up to 31,000 deaths in 2018 from the synthetic opioids, which includes fentanyl deaths. So that's, that's, that's heroin and cocaine combined. So when people talk about this fentanyl problem, that's, this is the, these are the numbers that they're looking at. It's just a, it's a huge growth. Um, here's how it's being smuggled in. So uh, this is an example of a, a concealment in a fire extinguisher. So this powder was stuffed into the top of a fire extinguisher to hide it from law enforcement. Uh, here's a, just a, a suitcase filled with pills. So all of those pills there in bags. And then here is the um, heroin concealed in a vehicle bumper. So they actually like, took the bumper plastic off and pulled out all of the impact, um, you know, foam and stuck in drugs and then put the plastic bumper back on. Now, how they discovered this, I don't know, in terms of searching the vehicle. I had a, yeah, what's that? I said dogs. Yeah, dogs, there you go. A friend of mine, and is sort of the friend of the, friend of the family, he was, um, went into the military and he came back and, and got a job with DPS. And he was just, he said he was just lucky a lot of times in discovering hidden drugs. One time, he, you know, he, he talks to the person, uh, something seems off, something seems suspicious. So he asked them, can I search the car? And a lot of them are confident that, that they've hidden it well. And so they say, yeah, have a, you know, have at it. So he searches the vehicle in and out, really gets uh, thorough. And one time he was closing the door and he closed the door and it didn't seem the right weight. You know, it was a, it was a smaller car, it's a Toyota. And, and he thought the door should be lighter than that. And he went over and he closed the other doors and he was like, yeah, that door is fishy and so he took the side panel off and it was had drugs all in the door so he just noticed by the how the door closed that it was off um, another time he was it was a flatbed like agricultural truck 
that had a wooden flat deck and he um he got permission to search that vehicle and he's looking all through the vehicle doesn't find anything and he's about to let the guy go and he's got his arm or hand on the flat bed part of the truck and he looks over and the boards are really old you know it's an old agricultural truck but the carriage bolts that are holding these old boards on were new <laughs> and so he went and got his wrenches and undid some of the bolts and underneath was all the drugs under those boards on the flatbed and so he, he like he got a really quick reputation of being able to find um hidden drugs in these vehicles when he said i, I really just got lucky a couple of times but you know he was observant and it was pretty neat mm -hmm. so they're pretty clever in how they hide things now here's another one where they're hiding it like by making realistic looking pills and so this is a um, a counterfeit tablet. So they will actually, these, like this sack is full of counterfeit tablets. So you have prescription drugs and then they can buy the little dyes then when they press the pellets and it's a pellet press very similar to what we have in Pekin uh, where you're making tablets for the um, for the bomb calorimeter and, and you can buy these little dyes and you press it down and it presses that powder into you know the form you've got the drug mixed in with dextrose to give it some some strength and you press it into form and you've got the little logos and everything and you can sell it so you're selling it as a oxycodone but it's maybe some oxycodone with a lot more fentanyl in it and that's how people are dying because they think they're taking oxycodone they know how that behaves they know how their body reacts to it and they take something more potent so it's pretty awful um, here's another video of that. So, um, you know, it's pretty scary when you see things like this. Body cam video released tonight by the San Diego Sheriff's Department. It shows a deputy on the brink of death after being exposed to fentanyl. The deputy, saved by his partner, who was equipped with a life saving medicine known as Narcan. We do want to warn you, what you're about to see is difficult to watch. Oh, no. Dramatic body cam video capturing the moment Corporal Scott Crane of the San Diego County Sheriff's Department is promising his trainee, Deputy David Fivey, he's not going to let him die after Fivey was exposed to fentanyl while processing drugs at the scene of an arrest in early July. That discovery caught on Five Eyes' own body cam just minutes earlier. Yes, it's a powder. It's okay to put up. It's just a powder for a The synthetic opioid is 50 times more potent than heroin. He said it's a powder. He was looking in the car. He said it's a powder. Deadly consequences. In Five Eyes' case, so that's him right there. No gloves. Was the most innocent. A couple seconds later, he took some steps back and collapsed. So there he goes. I that fast. And yeah. I and he was OD. Corporal Crane was equipped with a nasal spray Narcan, a prescription medicine that rapidly reverses the effects of an overdose. Isn't that amazing? He lives, by the way, so if you're worried. <laughs> so, so he said, my lungs just locked up. I couldn't breathe. So he was aware of what happened. Yeah. And it went right through his skin. So that's just, I wanted to get to that point where it says like he couldn't breathe, he, he touched it and, and that was, you know, it's a white powder. Now, so, so the old detective shows where they're like, wipe the white powder. No, that's okay. yeah. <laughs> Those days are gone. <laughs> so, yeah, you always watch those and you're like, what do you do it? Yeah. I do that in the lab all the time, you know. <laughs> that looks that look like nickel chloride. Yeah, yeah, that's nickel chloride. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Yeah. And so let's um let's take a little little um trip down top hat lane. Okay, so let's see. So what new factor has made it even more urgent to wear gloves when handling suspected <laughs> drug evidence? 
pretty obvious. I'm just seeing if you're awake today. <laughs> what? What's happening? They're asking me to rate the site, and I'm like, hold on. <laughs> yeah, what is that? I just, yeah. Tell us how great it is while you're just being penalized. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, very good. Okay. So you guys, 100%, I'm taking a picture, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Especially after seeing the guy pass out from that. And so then uh, some drug busts have found pill presses with dye blocks that create fake pharmaceutical impressions on the tablets. Which category does the pill press fall into? So that's the paraphernalia. It's making pills, but it's not a pill. So we're, it's one of the, the items used in the drug trade. So it would be a paraphernalia. Okay, so let's go back to the notes. Now we'll get into the alkaloids. It's most, the most common one would be the, the, the plant extracts like the opiate alkaloids. So this is a pretty amazing thing. I mean, you, you just take the poppies, the poppy seeds, and again, you can get about seven kilograms of raw opium from a thousand square feet of poppy field. That's a pretty small space. I mean, you know, if you had a thousand square foot house, that'd be a tiny house, that'd be like a one bedroom house. So that's that size space uh, can give you seven kilograms of raw opium. Now the milky latex that comes out of those poppy seed pods here, this right here, that little white drop is 10% morphine. It's pretty concentrated. Of course, you can make it even more concentrated by cooking it up. But, but you know, it's this is where all of the opioids come from. Is from this uh, this milky latex from the poppy seed pods. And so you can extract those directly. You can get morphine from that. You can get codeine and thebane. Notice the differences here. The reactivity is in these uh, number three and number six site on this fused ring structure. And so if those are both hydroxyl groups, then that's morphine. If you have a methoxy here on one of them, you have codeine. So on the three site, you have a methoxy group. On the six site, you have an OH. But Thebane has both of them. Okay, both of them are methoxy groups. Now, if you take uh, morphine and you acetylate it, you could have six monoacetylmorphine, diacetylmorphine. You could have three monoacetylmorphine. Uh, you could come over here and acetylate codeine and you have acetylcodeine. Uh, if you um, dehydrate or take the hydrogen off, essentially, um, uh, oxidize it a little more, then you end up with oxycodone. So codeine oxidized gives you oxycodone. Okay. Uh, the, the main ones I'm going to focus on, as you can see from the, the drug cards and some of the questions, are the morphine and the, the heroin pieces here. Okay. So if you have acetyl groups, um, in both places, that's heroin, diacetylmorphine. Okay, and then the, the MAMs, those are the monoacetylmorphine. And if you have the acetyl in the six group, that's a six MAM. If you have it in the three position, that's a three MAM. And so this, uh, this heroin synthesis, that three position is the most reactive. And so if it's undercooked, you'll have more three men because the process was stopped too soon. If it's just right, you get heroin. If it's overcooked, 
then you get six man. Or if it's old. So this is just a little bit of speciation that would, you know, again, would be evidence, would be chemical evidence. Um, so you would get maybe amounts of morphine left over. You might have the potency or the amount of heroin. And then the, the combination, What? how much 3-MAM is in there, how much 6-MAM is in there. And that would be a characteristic that you would want to know about that particular drug seizure is to characterize um, how much 3 or 6-MAM you have. This is typically performed in other countries. We don't have a lot of clandestine heroin production labs here in, in, uh, in the U.S. They're done, it's produced in other countries and then shipped over via mules or in shipping containers and so on. So this is an x-ray of a cross-border mule. And if you could look in here, I've got a couple of little asterisks. So look in closely right here. You see what looks like a giant capsule. It's probably a, probably about that big, like the size of my thumb, okay? Because that's about as big a thing I can swallow, you know, comfortably. And so it's a it's a like a rubber balloon type substance filled with heroin. And this person has them all inside their intestines. So there's, there's there you see a lot of them here. You see several up here in their stomach, okay, stomach and intestines. And so they just walk across the border with all of this in them. They have, I don't know how many times the lethal dose in their body. So they're taking a huge risk. If one of those plastic things busts, then they're, they're gone. Okay. Also, I mean, they're involved with risky business, right? Um, maybe against their will. Um, but anyway, they're coming across the border with this in their body. They take a laxative or they throw it up and then they, they get that stuff back. So, you know, this, yeah, the think, think about the drug trade and, and taking these drugs. These drugs have been in gas, gas tanks. Gasoline's not the nicest solvent. <laughs> okay, recrystallized from gasoline. They've been in someone's GI tract. That's nasty. Okay, you know, they're made in, in a, like a feed trough in some other country with a, with a boat or, you know, as a stirring rod. Uh, that's just, I mean, Drugs are bad enough, but you think about how they're made and how they're transported. It's 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 enough to just uh, it makes me crazy just to think about. Um, now, looking at some of these separations, I, I put it I put a couple of these in here just so you would we notice again residual solvents like this would maybe be a um, uh, you might have residual chloroform. This is showing lab glassware, but again, Coke bottles and things like that would be the the, um, the glassware of choice, anything free, uh, anything seen as trash could be reused. And, and so, again, it's just this, this idea of, of salting things out with base if they're in the organic phase or uh, precipitating them out um, with HCL generators and so on. Uh, here's, <clears throat> here's the cocaine. So whenever in your drug flashcards you see this tropane ring, you know, that structure right there is indicating it's a cocaine-related substance. So you have, you know, stereoisomers here. You also have other kinds of, of uh, functional groups there. You have here the like pseudocaine with this particular equatorial axial uh, positioning. You swap those, you have allocaine. Uh, if you swap the top one and the bottom one, you have pseudoallocane. So you have all of these different types of substances based upon that tropane ring. <clears throat> you could take that dried chopped leaves and, pay, and, and, and extract them with ether. Um, again, you could add base to the, uh, to the aqueous phase, extract with an organic solvent, and that um, cocaine is going to be um, with a, with a base, it's going to be deprotonated. It's going to be neutral, so it's going to be dissolve. It's going to dissolve in the organic phase. So then you throw away the aqueous layer because that gets rid of all the aqueous soluble junk that you don't want. Then you add in uh, another aqueous layer and make it acidic, and that pulls the cocaine, protonated cocaine, into the aqueous layer. Layer 
So then you discard the organic layer and that gets rid of all the organic junk that you don't want. So you've taken the cocaine into the aqueous, uh, you've taken it into the organic layer and thrown away the aqueous soluble stuff. Then you moved it to the aqueous layer and thrown away the organic soluble stuff. And now you have purified it to some extent. Uh, you discard that organic layer, put a new organic layer in there, add base and, and filter and you salt it out. And then the other, you could do it the other way. You could go into uh, aqueous first and then extract it with an organic solvent and, and, and then salt it out. So and then you recrystallize it typically in kerosene or gasoline or something cheap and use an HCL generator. Now those are, the, again, the, sort of the homemade um, synthetic roots, alkaloids extracting, but then these synthetic drugs are difficult, like making LSG is not really a homemade drug. It's going to be made by um, someone with pharmaceutical equipment. Uh, you have other alkaloids that can be extracted, like from fungus or cactus, um, mushrooms. The joke here, this, uh, this peyote cactus is a uh, Williamsy. The guy named it Williams, it was named Williams, no relation. Okay. So um, now some do not generate hallucinations, but rather cause sort of out-of-body out of experiences. So this discoverer of LSD tried it in the extreme, and he would experience hallucinations and write down what he what he experienced. Um, and then he had severe crises, demonic transformations, but he was addicted to it. So he called it his problem child, but he would, he would write down um, his experiences with LSD. Then you have the non-alkaloids. Um, <clears throat> they, so the amphetamine family, not a not yet again, not uh, extracted from plants. They're they're synthetic drugs. Um, so ecstasy and its derivatives, or MDMA, and then uh, PCP and ketamine. Now the one PCP is that. Uh, have y'all heard it called the Superman drug? A lot of times this is uh, um, whenever the police are having a hard time subduing somebody, it's because they're on PCP. It has a really strange feature that your body kind of has a regulatory um, network that will not allow you to damage your muscles. I mean, when you exert your muscles, you're tearing fibers, okay? And there's sort of a, a limit on that mm -hmm. so that you don't completely destroy your muscles. And PCP can turn that limit switch off so that you can use every fiber in your muscles. Now you're going to be destroying a lot of muscle tissue and, and later you're going to pay a terrible price for that. You have, you know, muscle injuries, but in the moment you have what we would consider unusual strength. It's not really superhuman strength. It's still human strength, but it's every muscle fiber firing because normally your body restricts that. And, and so PCP turns that signal off. And so then, you have, again, these are just other, other drugs of abuse. And then you have this real big problem now with diverted pharmaceuticals. So this is a um, picture of the kinds of entries that you have in what we would call the physician's desk reference. So I don't know if you noticed, but if you check ibuprofen or Tylenol or whatever, the pills are a certain color, a certain shape, they have certain numbers on them. And so those, are, those aren't just um, made up you know, by uh, some company, they, they actually decide on the markings that go on the pills, the color that is used, and so on. And so it's sort of, it's a standard for that particular uh, drug. And so you would see like Oxycontin here, it has OC on one side and 20 on the other. And so that's going to be a 20 milligram Oxycontin. Here's an 80 milligram and it's gray so that you can tell the difference. It's a different size as well. Um, that size is way bigger than 60 more milligrams, <laughs> okay? So again, most of these tablets are dextrose or like starch, okay? So you have a starch tablet with a little bit of active ingredient in it. Think about what 20 milligrams would be. You guys have weighed stuff out on balances. That's, that's what is that, 0 0.020. So you're trying to move that, that second decimal place with the spatula and put a little bit more on there. 
It's just the tip of a spatula is all the active ingredient is. So what makes up the rest of that pill is starch. <coughs> and so going from this 20 milligram pill to the 80 milligram pill, um, again, that's not all active ingredient. They've actually just made it bigger so that it looks more substantial. Um, and they've changed the color so that you don't get them mixed up. If you're used to taking 20 milligrams and that's enough to manage your pain, uh, going to 80 would be four times more. Um, and you see here Vicodin, they have quite a bit of difference in their markings and the shape of the pill. Okay. And here, Darvaset, so it's got an orange coating on it. It has Lily, Eli Lily Labs written on there, Darvaset on the back. Um, the Valiums have a little V cut out of the middle. Okay. And so a clandestine drug lab would get tablet presses with dyes that look like this, and they could make fake or counterfeit pharmaceuticals. Uh, now, diverted pharmaceuticals are pharmaceuticals that are stolen or um, you know, with participation of a crooked uh, pharmacy, you know, diverted. <coughs> and in that uh, threat assessment that I put up on Blackboard, you can read through there and there's a whole section that talks about the number of robberies and burglaries where opioids were stolen. And you can see that those incidents are tracked as well. And they're in the, they're in the hundreds to thousands. Now here's a, <coughs> an alert from the DEA a couple years back, and it just talks about the counterfeit oxycodone pill and heroin and fentanyl found in these ecstasy pills. Uh, this was operating in a Bronx apartment building. So here's a, uh, so this is pictures of some of the evidence that they found. You got bags of pills. Um, you've got some powders in here too, little, little uh, dye packs for the, you know, the press, the pellet press and so on. Um, here's a close up of some of the pill packs. And then this is some of the stuff that they found. They found, found 3,000 uh, purported oxycodone pills. Um, this was the, the setup. The guy was going to buy or propose uh, selling 3,000 of these pills for $20,000. And so that was an undercover agent that they were trying to sell them to. Oops. Okay. And so then they went and they found the pills were in a vacuum sealed bag. The search in the, of the apartment found a pill manufacturing operation. They had a pill press machine. So the PCHEM lab is one little pill at a time, right? Now they make machines that just roll these things out. You put the powder in and all the ingredients and they're just dropping them out the other side. Just add in the, add in the dyes and the powders. And, the, and uh, there's the dye that the press dye and then there's the color dye. So it's really confusing if you're, if you're just listening. <clears throat> um, they had Again, uh, different materials being cleaned, a surgical mask, a vacuum sealer, um, a refrigerator holding containers full of uh, different uh, colored pills, and other paraphernalia, cutting agents, grinders, and containers. Okay, so they had to, again, they're dealing with fentanyl, so the guys immediately went back outside and put on their respirators, put on their gloves, any kind of uh, PPE that they wanted to use to protect themselves from the from the fentanyl. Um, this is how uh, this Dr. Gosnell was caught. Uh, he was running a, a just a d disgusting uh, quote health clinic in Philadelphia, um, but they caught him and and discovered this health clinic was so was so bad uh, because he was selling scripts. And so he was writing scripts. So here's a doctor, a medical doctor, has the ability to prescribe medicine. And people were coming in, and um, he forged over 142,000, uh, well, prescriptions for over 142,000 tablets. Um, so here's an example of one informant that they started sending in there to gather evidence. Uh, you know, 60 of these tabs, the 90 Xanax, and so on. And they would, um, he would sell 200 scripts per night, 150 for the first one, $20 for each one after that. And these pills go for like 60 bucks a piece. And so you're, if you're getting 100 pills at 60 bucks a piece, that's a lot, you know, 6,000 bucks. Now, other laboratory operations, we're getting in now to the <clears throat> um, THC operations. And this is a THC extraction laboratory. So look at some of the equipment you have here. 
this is no longer fire extinguishers and Coke bottles, okay? We're dealing with a lot higher heat. We're dealing with steam distillation. We're dealing with um, oil extractions and so on. So you have these uh, spinning oil extractors. They look kind of like rotovaps, but they have uh, spinning structures where the oil is is, is spun and, and drips down and, and uh, this real tarry substance. So this, this THC oil is dripping out of here. Now, you know, pot is not just about, or marijuana trade is not just about finding buds to smoke, okay? It's more about the THC oil because this is the valuable piece that you can then sell to edible manufacturers. So here's uh, THC infused candy and cereal, okay? Um, why, I don't know, but... Um, so these uh, concentrates then are put into edibles, they're put into vaping uh, things, and, and the vaping if again, you have that addictive personality disorder, uh, some young people have put themselves in the hospital with what they call lipid pneumonia. So pneumonia is fluid in your lungs. Now you can get pneumonia in different ways. There's the traditional ways of bacterial infection. You can have bacterial pneumonia. You can get a virus, viral pneumonia. Again, it, pneumonia is that liquid in the lungs. So if you have an infection and the body's trying to fight it, fluid can get stuck in the lungs. Uh, but you can have chemical pneumonia. Like we talked about uh, breathing in ammonia gas, and so they have ammonia and pneumonia. Okay, so you get a water-soluble substance in your lungs, and then your body tries to dilute that water-soluble substance, and so you then have chemical pneumonia. Well, lipid, at least with water or aqueous-based pneumonia, your body is in a, an aqueous system, and you can put the person on diuretics. That's why they treat congestive heart failure. What's the congestive part? Your heart's not pumping hard enough and well enough to keep your lungs dry. And so water will flow into your lungs and you get, it's like pneumonia, but it, they call it congestive heart failure. They dry them out. They put them on Lasix, which dries them out. So they basically dehydrate the body and that will dehydrate the lungs. All that works if the liquid in your lungs is aqueous. But people that vape too much are, it's the vaping oils and that oil gets in the lungs. And yeah, it may be carried by steam vapor or water vapor, but the oil, we can if you get enough of it in your lungs and it starts to coalesce and make oil droplets, there's no easy way to get oil out of your lungs because now it's in the air sacs and it's in a really difficult situation. And so when you see young people that are hospitalized for lipid pneumonia, they've been vaping way too much. They've sucked so much oil, evaporated oil into their lungs that now it's formed droplets and it's a really difficult situation. And if they've been uh, vaping THC oil, they can go past the regular high that people uh, think that, that marijuana gives you and go right into the hallucinogenic stage and the psychotic stage. You can even do that with edibles. And so the first death of uh, Colorado teen and, and, uh, happened pretty soon after they made it legal. Um, this, uh, this edible called this Rookie Cookie by, made by this uh, group um, made these cookies and the serving size was one-sixth of a cookie. Who eats one-sixth of a cookie? Like, why did they make that way? You know, that doesn't make any sense. Um, and they're not like cutting up leaves and putting it in there, injecting the THC oil in the, in the batch and mixing it up. And so there was some thought that maybe this was a batch to batch variability and this person got a hot cookie with way too much. So they, in cooperation with the police after this death, they gave all of their cookies over to the authorities and they tested them and they found that their batch to batch was not, not the problem. It was the serving size that was the problem. So the teen uh, had never had any uh, exposure to THC, so they were naive to its effects. Uh, the people at the party told them, uh, take one bite, you know, one six, take one bite and wait. And after 30 minutes, he didn't feel any, any effect because it's inedible. It takes a while to go through the stomach and get into the bloodstream and give the effect. And so he ate the rest of the cookie. And then over the next couple of hours, became more and more psychotic and then jumped out of a fourth floor window out, uh, off the balcony at a hotel and died. So, you know, that's 
it's sort of this ad- attitude around marijuana that, oh, you know, you smoke it, it's not much different than drinking, you know, it's not a problem. But there are other sides to that story, specifically the oils, because you can get really concentrated vaping oils and really concentrated edibles. And so we're going to see more trouble with this. So that's sort of my um, PSA, <laughs> if you will. Yeah. <clears throat> so again, this is going to be different kinds of evidence too in the lab. How are you going to test a chocolate chip cookie for nanograms per milliliter of THC <laughs> or, or nanograms of THC? You're going to have to extract it. You're going to have to grind it up. It's not going to be a pill or a powder anymore. So we need another P for the cookies. I don't know. <laughs> you, you'd come up with that. All right? I don't know what you would put that in. But uh, it's not a pill. It's not a powder. Um, it's a package. Uh, I'm, I'm trying. I'm working on it. Um, but you would grind it up. You know, you would, you know, try to pulverize it as much as possible. Put it in with an, with an aqueous solvent or or an organic solvent and try to extract the analyte and then try to eliminate the, the non-analytes and, and figure it out. So this is what method development would be about. And if you get into that kind of part of the crime lab, that's, that's sort of the next level is method development. Uh, you're probably not going to get into it your first day, right? But after a couple of years of experience and so on, and they're saying, hey, we need as a lab to come up with a method for this because we've got to test 150 cookies. And what are we going to do? How are we going to get the analyte? And so that would be a, an exciting part of the job when you get into the method development part. Okay. <clears throat> All right, y'all have a great day. <laughs>